Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to So Very Wrong About Games. I'm your co-host, the man with the face for radio and the voice for blogging, Mark Bigney. And with me, as always, is the man with the voice of an angel and the face of a devil, a handsome devil, Michael Walker. How you doing, Walker? I'm doing great, Mark. How are you today? I'm very well, thanks. We are going to be positive today. We're going to talk about board games. We're going to talk about board games this week. We're going to talk about the games we played last week. We're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter but with a hopeful heart, and we're going to talk about our feature game, and our feature game this week is Clans of Caledonia. So, Walker, with all of that in mind, let us begin this discussion of this hobby that we love. What games have you played this week? This week, Mark, I got to play, I think, my favorite game, Gaia Project. We brought it up on uh, Tabletop Simulator. Dr. Stallone and I knocked this out, and I I just cannot help but just say that this is still my most favorite game out there. It just has it all. It has the 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 theme, the presence on the table. It's just all around fun. I love it. All the races <laughs> are very unique and different. I just they took uh Terra Mystica, a game that was already very polished and amazing, and they just condensed it down into this sci-fi experience that I think is great. Well, I'll correct you right there. I don't think condensed is an accurate word with respect to Gaia Project. And this is not a, a major criticism. I'm just saying that condensed and Gaia Project don't really belong in the same sentence. This is so true. And it is very appropriate that you're talking about Gaia Project and Terra Mystica, because given that we were going to be discussing Clans of Caledonia later, I don't think that this is the last time we will be mentioning those games. I don't know what you're talking about. I just want to reiterate something I've said every time Gaia Project comes up. I feel like revisiting it. I've never been particularly gung-ho about Gaia Project. I I, I tried to express why in a review of it more than a year ago. But I do want to go back to it. I want to try it again. Definitely not on Tabletop Simulator, though. That is not the way to reintroduce the system to me that I have misgivings about. Because I'm definitely going to have my, my opinions colored by the format. But once things are done... Once, once things are somewhat back to normal, I would very much appreciate sitting down with you in front of some cardboard and plastic and, and playing Gaia Project again. Oh, we'll have to add some out because it, it lost a bit with only the two of us playing it. I know it really it plays much better when there's more people. So I think three to four is by far the ideal number for that game. Absolutely agreed. I've been playing more of Legacy of Dragonholt. I started enthusing about Legacy of Dragonholt last week, and I've been playing nearly every day. I'm trying not to burn through the content. See, my enthusiasm is at war with my desire to let the story breathe. And you've expressed interest in playing my copy when I'm done, and after you're done with it, we're actually going to be sending it to one of our commissioners, who immediately called Dibs. Uh, so I do need to get through the story. But I don't feel this is a burden, this is rather a joy. And I just want to elaborate on the way that everything managed to double down on the narrative. And this is one of the geniuses of the system that Nikki Vanlins came up with. And by the way, she says on Twitter that she's looking for authors to collaborate with, specifically romance authors to collaborate with, for the next sort of choose-your-adventure-style game that she wants to design. I don't know if it's going to be using the same system, but let me tell you, I'll say, I'll tell you what I told her. I will play any narrative game she puts out, because after Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition Legacy of Dragonhold, she knows how to put story in a game. And she puts all these other quote-unquote narrative games to shame. Absolute and utter shame. Legacy of Dragonhold gets, does everything right just the way a lot of good narrative RPGs do, in giving you just enough prompts to make you flesh out a character so you can put your hooks into the story, thinking about why your character would do what they're doing. And every paragraph that relies on your character's skill is therefore inflected with your character's personality, drives, background, motivation, etc. And all this without any sort of lengthy prompts or overdone story text. Despite the fact that your character is entirely silent, you get this hook because it's not like you pass a stat check. If I pass a stat check, that's not narrative. That's a blunt gameplay mechanism usually revolving around some sort of silly die rolling. But on the other hand, if you tell me that how I might resolve this encounter with some bandits is going to change based on whether or not I have the survival skill, well then, that implicates why I gave my character the survival skill to begin with. And it wasn't in Legacy of Dragonhold because it gives you a stat bonus to this or a bonus to this roll or that the other thing. No, it is all narrative, all background, all character. And so you end up with these lovely textured encounters where you supply this added bit of narrative grist, and it is so wonderful. I'm having such a joy. Every encounter is very memorable. I I think back on all the things that my character has done. I don't think I'd ever replay it. This is not about replayability, because I've already put my imprimatur on what's happened. It's kind of like playing a very, very narrative-heavy video game with an entirely different character. Suddenly, 
they have the wrong face. These events that were burned into my mind are indelibly associated with certain characteristics, and I don't know that I'd want to see them completely upended in that way, which goes to show you the amount of engagement, how engrossed I am, and how much ownership I feel like I have over the narrative. Because let's be honest, and this is true of video games as well, this is often just an elaborate con or a shell game where you're fooling the player into thinking that they are the author of the story. Because the designer's hands are all over it. The job of a good designer, and this is very much in the same way of designing a Euro game, you want to back off, let the mechanics be as minimalistic as possible. Similarly, in the context of a narrative game, you don't want the, the author's fingerprints all over everything, drowning out the player's engagements with the story. And Legacy of Dragonhold is just a master class of doing that. I do have very strong opinions and associations with the characters that Nikki Valens has inhabited her world with, but I'm non they're nonetheless inflected indelibly with my relationship to them as a character and as a player. And so I cannot wait to do the rest of Legacy of Dragonhold, but as I say, I don't want to burn through it too quickly. I just want to let it, let it savor a little bit, but I've been playing it every other day now since I first talked about it last week. My highest possible recommendation, that's been my further experiences with Legacy of Dragonhold. You and I got to play Race for the Galaxy. This is a game by Thomas Lehman, and it's put out by Rio Grande Games. And I don't really have to say anything good about it because there's a lot of people already out there that know that this is a fantastic game. But some of you might be off-put. Apparently, people go on about, you know, the crazy amount of symbology and all this other stuff. Needless to say, it is quite easy to pick up, in my opinion. The, car the way the cards are laid out, it tells you their abilities in each phase or each different type of uh, action in the game, so you know exactly what you're doing. And I found, I don't know if this is the same for everybody, I found the very unique part of this game is that when you get into a, a sort of a, a tableau builder like this where you need specific cards, right? It says, you know, you know, get you know, get uh, Imperial cards or, or find brown planets, right? And a lot of these games you have a really hard time getting the cards you need. You know they're in your deck, but you have a hard time getting the ones you're worried that someone else will pick them up or whatever. But it, they solve it in a very unique way in this game, and which is the fact that the cards, you use the cards to pay for everything. So you have a heavy, heavy cycle already through the deck. So you're seeing waves and waves of cards, and then you're just, and it's not as though you're just discarding them for nothing, but you're paying for some of the cards that you need. So it, it's a really nice balance that makes you feel as though you're actually, you know, you're not just wasting the cards, and you are finding the cards you need, and you sort of are being a little liquidy, right? You know, you okay, I sort of need all these, but, you know, like you have some couple little side quests sort of thing that you're doing it's like okay well you know if i'm not finding these i need but i'll you know double down on this part of the game i think i am really looking forward to playing more of race for the galaxy and it increases the tension too right because you might have a handful of cards and you know you can't pay for them all and so you have to suddenly ditch this card that you know you could have done something with but at the end of the day it's got to go because you're making your priorities and I have to say, with respect to the accessibility of the game, not to contradict you, I've taught Race for the Galaxy dozens of times, literally, and this was the easiest explanation I've ever done. Number one, because you picked up on it very quickly, and number two, because we played on Board Game Arena, and in Board Game Arena, they do the marvelous, marvelous thing of essentially giving you the Rosetta Stone for all the Race for the Galaxy cards. You don't need to learn the symbology at all. It's all explained through text. You mouse over a card, and yeah, you can see the graphics, you can see the icons that correspond to all this, but... It will just tell you, oh, investment bank, well, it gives it gives you this bonus to development in text, in plain English, very much in the same way that Roll for the Galaxy dispensed with the iconography entirely. I'm not saying that Race for the Galaxy should have cards like that all the time. I don't think it would work. I do like the iconography, and having internalized it, I think it works marvelously. But the fact that Board Game Arena will ease you into this with sort of a built-in cheat sheet on every card is marvelous. And I'll also say another thing about Board Game Arena, which I was very, very impressed with, and this is, this is props to their implementation, they had every expansion, and you can play with every possible configuration. And as I've said before, I'm very particular about the way I like to play Race of the Galaxy. And I was able to ease you in first with one expansion, then with two more expansions. And we were able to do it just the way that I like to play Race of the Galaxy, which is marvelous. I was not expecting that. I was expecting to have to play with some of the elements that I didn't really appreciate in some of the later expansions. And so I'm very, very glad that you enjoyed it. I, I, I've been saying for years that I think it's the best tableau builder ever made. And I'm very glad that there's a whole bunch of people now that might have that might be able to turn to it because there's this new accessible version on a free, excellent web implementation. Although, again, still the lack of undo is a bit of a problem and minor particular quibble about the implementation of Board Game Arena. Sometimes you click on a card to keep it. Sometimes you click on a card to discard it. So you have to be very careful and read the text very carefully about what it's asking you to do and why. 
Yeah, this is what I was going to say at the end. Regard, you know, you're going on about how great Board Game Arena is. We did have, like you said, a couple quibbles where there was no confirmation where you would you would say, okay, I would say now pick three cards to discard. And in most games, you'd go, okay, I think I'll discard this one and this one and this one. And then you know you sort of think about it, and you know you <laughs> finally conf- you, you know you can conf- you click on your three and you say, okay, yeah, those are three. And then you click discard. Not in this game. You click one, two, and then as soon as you click that third card, boop, gone. And oh. Oh, I, I guess I'm discarding those three cards. And like you said, they flip back and forth between, you know, pick these to discard or pick these to keep. And sometimes, you know, you're not quite sure or, you know, you'd fail to read what it said. And suddenly, you know, your whole strategy is in the discard pile. I will give it credit, though, as someone who has to explain the game, the fact that I didn't have to explain how any card worked was such a load off. And so I'll give them credit for that. But yes, the other aspects of the implementation can be a little bit dodgy. And so that was perennial favorite, Race for the Galaxy. I I mean, if you have ever enjoyed a tableau builder and you have not tried Race for the Galaxy, you're doing yourself a disservice. I can't say that often enough. I played Star Wars X-Wing 2nd Edition because I'm a fool. I had been hearing for years about how 2nd Edition of X-Wing had solved a number of problems with the 1st Edition, how the meta had evolved in an interesting way. I never really gave much credence to that because my experience has been that Fantasy Flight manages metas with all the subtlety and precision of a jackhammer, careening wildly from buffs to this and nerfs to that and, and pages of errata and what have you. But one thing, clever thing they did with uh, X-Wing 2nd Edition is everything's digital now, so you don't have to worry about cards being updated. They'll just be updated for you digitally, which is nice. And honestly, the Tabletop Simulator mod and the Vassal mod for Star Wars X-Wing are So incredibly choice. They automate movement, they automate collisions, they automate rage calculations, they automate everything. It's really, really impressive. And so all these led me to try it again. And I'll say that X-Wing is still mostly the same game. My my beasts with X-Wing are as follows. Number one, it encourages you to deny your opponent's play. You want to make sure that they don't get to shoot at you because you've dodged. That part I'm okay with. It encourages you to load up your opponents with stress so they don't get to, get to do actions. It encourages you to load up your opponents with all sorts of debuffs and do all sorts of weird things since they don't get to do their cool things. I don't like it when a minis game encourages that. It also revolves a lot around blocking your opponent in other ways, like physically putting your ship in their way so they bump into you. And when you bump into another ship in X-Wing, nothing happens. And I don't like it when there's a bias towards inaction. This is further compounded in X-Wing because there's a bias for inaction because very very much like dogfighting, I'll give you credit for that, you pass by, you engage in some, some fires, some broadsides, and then you spend a long time desperately trying to get back into engagement with just some useless turns or something. Sometimes it doesn't work that way, but sometimes it does. And the entire time I was playing X-Wing, I was thinking I would rather be playing Gaslands. Gaslands gives me more flexibility with builds, it gives me more flexibility what to do, and when you make a mistake in Gaslands... Something cool happens, not nothing happens. The bias is for action. The bias is for fun things happening rather than the bias being for nothing happening. And so I very much appreciated being able to try the mod out. Uh, but for all its its features, I will say, again, because we're, we're talking a little bit about implementations here, it still had one of those some of those charming features the tabletop simulator has. Like, oh, that piece, it's just gone now. Wh- why did it go away? Who's to say? Uh, I had a recurring bug where every time I tried to roll a die, it would delete the die the first time. That wasn't awesome, but that at least was was fixable. Then a ship disappeared for no reason. Uh, Then a marker uh, flew through the air with such force that it knocked over one of my ships. Fun times. Fun times. But they've done a marvelous job with the program. Uh, A lot of really good automation. Very successful implementation. That's the thing about, about minis games, right? I'm always drawn to the minis games that have such a huge user base because they have such great support, such great retail availability, such great variety of units. But usually I don't like them. That's why I always look over at the 40k players with envy in my eye. And I'm sitting in my Infinity Corner, which is, by miniatures game standards, very well supported. But, you know, a tiny niche of a tiny niche of a tiny niche, as opposed to merely a tiny niche of a tiny niche. And I, I still look, you know, at X-Wing enviously, but also, you know, give me a choice between fielding a Forlom and a G1A Starfighter and how cool that is, and being able to trick out a Mustang and crash into things. I'll take the latter nine times out of ten. So I, I very much appreciated being able to see what Star Wars X-Wing has been doing over the past few years, because I used to play somewhat regularly, and I, I gave up largely out of frustration of the, the format and of how Fantasy Flight was handling the meta. And it's still mostly the same game, but it's it's been slightly slightly evolved. And so that was my experience with Star Wars X-Wing 2nd Edition. Well, seeing your uh, platform problems remind me of the other game we tried to play and were eventually successful, which was 
Guards of Atlantis 2. This is put out by Wolf Designer and designed by... Artem Nichiporov. And I have to say that this is my, my, my best game of Guards of Atlantis 2. I had the most fun. When you were talking about uh, denying people their fun, it sort of reminded me about the only drawback I had in that game. It was sort of the same th- sort of thing. You sort of build up your turn. You sort of figure out how to get close to the person and then you save that one, you know, attack, one or two attack cards you have, but you, you know, you finally get it to play it, but no, you know, they got there faster and you're dead and you're back at the beginning and you don't get to do that one thing that you've been sort of building up to do. But other than that, oh yeah, I have written here, poison is dumb, dumb, dumb poison, poison <laughs> is dumb. Yeah, you don't get poisoned in that game, that is absolutely sure. We've talked about this in the context of the original Guards of Atlantis. The special abilities are awesome, but they're not like a lot of other games with lots of special abilities or lots of dice rolling. You don't just play a card and then something happens. You have to set it up, and you have to outthink your opponent. You have to outplay your opponent. That's where you get a lot of the tension. And honestly, as a consequence, it's much more satisfying. In the game we played, we had two new players and the two of us, and we have differing levels of experience with the system. We all got to do something cool over the course of the game. And I got to say, speaking personally, when I'm playing a new character or even playing an experienced character, when I line up all my ducks in a row and and that Gambit succeeds, I feel like a genius. And that's awesome. I don't feel like in other games where I just, oh, I finally got to trigger the ability that I paid for. I rather feel, haha, my plan has succeeded. I am some sort of Hyperborean mastermind. This is despite the fact that in our game of Guards of Atlantis 2, and you spoke of failures, we initially tried on Tabletopia. Tabletopia is a blight on humankind, and so then we resorted to the curse on humankind, which is not as bad as a blight, Tabletop Simulator. Where's the Vassal mod for Guards of Atlantis? That's what I want to know. And uh, I got to play as Wasp. Wasp is, uh, her official title, I think, is Queen of the Underboob, uh, High Lord of the Crotch Blanket. And uh, she's my least favorite character, both graphically and in terms of game effects. I've never liked Wasp, and I still had a blast. I had a really, really good time playing, despite the fact that I don't like that character and I don't like the way she works. But that, again, speaks to the character differentiation in Guards of Atlantis. So I'm very glad that you were enthusiastic because, again, some people, and Artem Nitschporov has been very, very clear about this, Guards of Atlantis is not for everybody, and Guards of Atlantis 2 is no exception. And some people get very frustrated. When when you can't get your special abilities to line up, when you get ganked, when you get outsmarted or overcome or countered by somebody, some people respond with frustration, and I am often one of those people. Uh, but then a well-designed game, especially a well-designed game that's calibrated to the sensibilities of a competitive st- strategy game player, might in- it might inspire the contrary reaction, which is what I've seen Guards of Atlantis do inspire more often than not, which is, this is intriguing, I want to keep playing this, and I want to see how I can fig- figure work this out. As somebody who hosts games, as somebody who teaches, teaches games, I'm often a little bit nervous about Guards of Atlantis precisely because I love it so much and I know how good it is and I want everyone else to love it so much. So when I see them failing to trigger their abilities, I'm often worried that they're not going, that they're not enjoying themselves, they're getting frustrated. But this was definitely true when we played at Shucks, for example. But after the game at Shucks, after two, two players had been systematically shut down, both of them said, that was awesome, I want to try that again. Which I think is a testament to the strength of the game and how high the skill ceiling is. So I'm glad you had a great time out a great time too definitely leads me to believe that the the characters need to be definitely broken down into more categories like i was thinking about afterwards it should be like you know only use these characters in a four-player game only use these characters in a six-player game or these are the starting characters you know I, i really feel as though they need to be categorized better so people get off the start get a better experience yes i am sympathetic to that claim and let me tell you that I've had this discussion with Artie a number of times. He resists that for a very valid reason, which is to say characters can fulfill vastly different functions and have vastly different complexity levels and have vastly different interactions based on how you build them, based on how you level them up and how you choose to play them. And I'm very, very sympathetic to that, but I'm also, I think, equally if not more sympathetic to your view, which is that a game of this complexity and of this depth and of this level, this number of moving pieces, needs to have as smooth an on-ramp as possible so as to maximize the potential audience. And that was our play of Guards of Atlantis 2. Poison's lame. <laughs> I got to play A War of Whispers. A number of listeners have been asking for our opinions of A War of Whispers, and based on your reaction, Walker, you might indeed be one of them, despite the fact that you're not a listener. A War of Whispers is kind of sort of an area control game with a sort of veneer of intrigue on top because your scoring conditions are secret. 
you do not play as an empire. You instead play as some sort of spy organization. And at the end of the game, you will score based on how well your secret allegiance, or maybe open allegiance, depending, has done over the course of the game. So there's five different colors on the map, but then there's the four-player factions. I was not optimistic about A War of Whispers, largely because I have seen games like this play out before, and I tend to be very, very unsatisfied with both the scoring conditions and the kind of incentives that it sets up. I've played a number of games where they say, look, you should do feints with other people's factions. You know, who knows why you did that thing? And my response to that is often, why would I waste a turn of mine handing an opponent points just to confuse people? You had better make sure that the information management is very carefully calibrated so that that's viable. And I'm I'm open to that being a very, very interesting gameplay experience. And I definitely get that sort of, why are you doing that thing? Convince me why you're doing that thing. But I tend to get those out of social deduction games, games like Secret Hitler, The Resistance, The Enemy Within, things like that. In A War of Whispers... The scoring system is, is fundamentally messed up. I, I, I have no enthusiasm for it whatsoever because at the start of the game, everyone just gets a random assortment of allegiances. Say you're playing a three-player game, Walker, and let's say that you and I are both told that the red faction is our preferred faction. And let's assume that, that the other jabroni hates the red faction and doesn't want them to score any points. Well, guess what? They're not going to win. They're already behind the eight ball. You and I are going to be implicitly or perhaps even later on openly colluding because we have our interests dovetailed with each other, and there's no reason for us to start kneecapping our preferred faction just for some notion of, ooh, but what's going on really? And the other player has two players that are buffing the faction that they hate. Now, the way you get around this in A War of Whispers is what you can do is you can swap your allegiances, but then your allegiance is openly known. Let's say by the end of turn two, player three has decided they're hopelessly out of the running, and they say, okay, well now I'm backing the red faction as well. Well, number one, now their cards are on the table, and now any purported benefit of this whole intrigue and mystery is completely gone. And number two, they are now just getting on the same train that you and I have already been on. And so they're just going to be piggybacking off what we're doing, and now there's three people that all want Red to do really well. And now it's not really a fun, competitive, tense experience, now is it? It's just some sort of weird semi-co-op thing. And not semi-co-op like the best game of all time, Nemesis, but semi-co-op just in the sense of we're kind of colluding. Now, have you ever played a game called uh, Age of Gods? I was just about to bring that up, Walker, because Age of Gods is the closest I've ever played to doing this well. Because Age of Gods, uh, although too long, has a very interesting structure and on-ramp where at the early game you are forced to take actions on behalf of factions before you know what your allegiance with those factions are. And so you're encouraged, kind of sort of like Imperial, but for different reasons, to engage in proxy wars and feints and maneuvers that, you know, you're indifferent to the consequence to, but you're not paying the opportunity cost of handing your op your opponent points in the process of, of sowing confusion. And Age of Gods was designed by Croc, for what it's worth. He published it before he published Claustrophobia. Croc's a good guy, and he has lots of good ideas. Age of Gods, I'd play in a heartbeat over over this thing. Especially since, on top of all this, so I've complained enough about the, the, the purported hook of A War of Whispers, the actual gameplay itself is incredibly dull and stodgy. There are fundamentally three actions you can do. You can put cubes in a region to buff a region, you can draw cards, or you can launch an attack, and, and fighting is uh, just like Antica fighting. It's one-to-one -one combat elimination. That's it. That's all you're doing. That's the, what you're doing the entire, the entire time. So then you might think, oh, so how do we spice this up? Well, the cards, of course, and the cards are ridiculous take-that nonsense. The cards are absurd, sort of, oh, the city that you've been defending over here with a million units? Oh, it's gone. No, sorry, you're gone. Go away. And so you get these cards, you're drawing these cards over the course of the game, and they're sufficiently difficult to draw that there's no reason not to save them until the last round. And in our game, and I don't know if this is aberrant, but honestly, looking back at the structures and the incentives that we have, there's no reason not to hold them to the very end. So you can play a card and make sure that there's fewer opportunities to recover from this cataclysmic kneecapping that you've inflicted on a faction for no other reason than you have to take that card that says just do it. So the actual gameplay is stodgy. The only interesting effects come from ridiculously arbitrary take that cards, and the scoring system doesn't work. So in other words, what you have is definitely the best game of the year. I found so little redeeming in A War of Whispers. It's on Kickstarter now. Back it if you want, but I see nothing to recommend it. I got to play Tobago on Board Game Arena. It's by Bruce Allen in Rio Grande Games. I'm only going to bring it up quickly just because Tobago is a game that you bring out maybe once a year. And you play it. It's very interesting, unique, and very fun to play. It's got this huge hexagon map, and they're all divided into different territories, be it jungle or ocean. And there's like a biggest one 
of each category and you'll start playing cards to find these treasures. You'll say, oh, it's next to the biggest ocean or it's in the biggest ocean or it's, or it's near these really cool terrain pieces like these Easter Island heads or, or palm trees. And it's a really interesting, you know, sort of deduction game where you move your little Jeep around and pick up treasures. I love those Jeeps. And it's fun if all of the people play it once a year. You go on Board Game Arena and you play it with someone who's already played it six times that day. <laughs> not such a fun experience, I found. Not, not will, I will not be playing Tobago on Board Game Arena again. How's your ELO ranking doing, Walker? Oh, I, I don't want to talk about ELO ranking. It, it's fine and good. I, I, I sort of looked into it and I was reading. There's some stuff on the guild if people are interested in, in board game arena ELO. We mentioned it last week and so how we sort of like blew it off or whatever. Yeah. And, and some of their points were valid. I'm really, I'm glad the fact that if you lose a game, you don't seem to lose any, at least the, the way I've, Anyway, we'll see. Well, well the if, points being made on the guild are eminently reasonable. ELO rankings are very useful when you're playing against randos on the internet. I am not going to play against randos on the internet. I have no interest in playing against randos on the internet. And so that's not really a feature for me. It just, it, and so as a result, since I only play with friends, it's a little bit of a strange capper to a game for the system to be saying, here's how your competitive ranking is going. It's like, ugh. So, uh, yes, we, I was overly dismissive last week, and I completely understand why some people rely on it and how it's a useful ter- tool. It's just an indication of uh, how there's a mismatch between that set of expectations and how I choose to use these programs. Yeah, I was going to talk a bit about that at the beginning and the fact that when this first started, I was really just happy just to get games played with uh, random people on the Internet. But then as I, I played that more and more, I found myself just missing, I think for me, the intricate part of playing board games is to play them with my friends. And that's not to say that for some people, they don't mind just playing with any, uh, anyone and everyone on the internet and getting really good at a game. But I just really feel for me, it's getting together with friends and enjoying the moment. So I, the more I'm playing online, the more I'm missing the, my usual board gaming, I'm afraid. Yep. Me too. And that was Tobago. So we played Tiny Forming Mars. I talked last week about Tiny Forming Mars in a solo context. This is the print-and-play game by Michael Bevilacqua, which is uh, heavily inspired by Terraforming Mars. And let's just start off with you, Walker. What did you think of Tiny Forming Mars? The the only thing I was going to say about this is, for what it sets out to do, it does a fantastic job. It's a free print-and-play or play-online game that gives you the feeling of Terraforming Mars. It's got the sort of, you know, icon build-up and, you know... And, and building something sort of together, sort of against each other, you know, with the force and the, you know what I mean? And I really feel maybe with a few more plays, it might be more interesting, but I, I don't feel like playing it more. Once you get to know all the cards, you can sort of anticipate what's coming up and then know what symbols you need and sort of plan a strategy, you know, ahead of time type thing. You know what I mean? Like plan ahead, but I, you know what I mean? I, it's just not enough there, but it's great for what, what they set out to do, I think. I think it is a very impressive distillation of some of the elements of Terraforming Mars. I'll say that I preferred Tiny Forming Mars to Terraforming Mars, but as people who have listened to this podcast before, for me, that's not saying very much. Yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was okay. It was largely procedural. The competitive aspects, I didn't really like the, the quote unquote draft at the beginning of the round is somewhat limited by virtue of the fact that you don't know what cards are coming up later. So you can take a project knowing that it's going to take some light bulbs, but you have no idea if those light bulbs are going to be coming up later on in the round at all. And so you might just be end up ending up with a project that's going to do nothing for you. So you feel like your choice was effectively wasted. And that's not particularly satisfying. And. As a result, it's, you know, just it, it, it trundles along. You're doing your projects and you're spending your money. And the tag management, as you say, is potentially interesting. And I found the, uh, the, the, the manipulation of the map slightly more engaging than the manipulation of the map in Terraforming Mars. But ultimately, it's, not pro- it's probably not something I'll come back to. And it, I was a little bit disappointed in it after having had such a good time with the other print-and-play game that I've been trying in the past couple of weeks, which is Under Falling Skies. Which is the, which is a solo game, admittedly, but Tiny Forming Mars, I'm glad to have tried it multiplayer, which is to say with, with two players as opposed to solo. And it, as an experiment, as a project, I think it's very interesting. As a game, I don't know that I'll go back to it. And lastly, for me, I just want to say that, uh, Teo Tawakin is finally on Board Game Arena. I played it a bunch of times. I'll talk more about that next week. And that's all I played this week. So on to the news and why it doesn't matter. Well, first off, in the hardly a surprise, uh, Gen Con has been canceled for 2020. 
I, I mean, everyone saw this coming, but now it's official. I, I am blaming you, Mark. Like, 100%. Like, I think they were going to go ahead, and then they heard you say, no, 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 it's going to be canceled. And then, and then the very next, I think it was the same day that it got, that it got canceled. So I, that, if anyone's upset, make sure you send all complaints to Air Canada, and they'll take care of you, I'm sure. There's going to be a Shot and Totten 2. Shot and Totten, also known as Battle Line, is Rainer Knizia's famed two-player card game. Battle Line got reprinted recently by GMT in a new art format, namely Battle Line Medieval. Same rules, just different coat of paint. Shot and Totten 2 will also have a new coat of paint, but it's going to have slightly different rules. So this is the first rules change in Shot and Totten since it was ever first published, other than the abominable special action cards, which, quite frankly, I think you should leave in the box. I don't know if they've been updated for the new version, but now in Shot and Totten 2, different areas are going to have different numbers of cards that are going to be played to them, rather than all of them being maxing out at three. That could lead to some potential interesting elements of geography, and I am always in favor of seeing what Reiner Knizia does to tweak his designs, and so I'll be looking forward to trying Shot and Totten 2. So... They released the Wingspan beta app this week. They had It was like for a short release. It was out for about four or five days. And I'm not sure what they're planning with it because it's completely different. They seem to have changed it. They took the 2019 board game of the year and they changed it into like a mediocre, uninspired, card-driven engine builder. <laughs> Just a reminder, send all your hit mail to support at aircanada.ca. <laughs> Finally, this is just a, a slight retread of what I've already said in So Very Wrong About All the Games You Like Are Bad, which I released last week to Patreon listeners. Comet uh, and Tribune, two games that we both like very, very much here at So Very Wrong About Games, are on Kickstarter for new editions. By the time you hear this, Comet will be on Kickstarter, and Tribune has been on Kickstarter for uh, a little bit now. And just to summarize what I had to say in my editorial, uh, I feel very disappointed that I'm not enthusiastic. I don't know that I'll be supporting either of these projects. The, all the graphic design decisions for both projects seem to me to be a massive step backwards, and so I'll be keeping my older editions with, with glee. Honestly, all the graphics that I've seen for Comet and Tri uh, Tribune in the new editions have been really, really disappointing in a lot of ways. Obviously, that's subjective, so take a look if you want to. If you don't have a copy of Tribune, Tribune is now very, very hard to track down. I can recommend that you that you get it because it's the best worker placement game of all time, but it's very expensive. But unlike a lot of other Kickstarters, it's not going to be in print afterwards. That's not how Spielworks have been doing things. So if you if you missed out on Demacher, which was the last project, good luck finding that. So I don't know. I, I don't know that I can recommend either of them really, but by the same token, uh, there's a scarcity to Tribune that does not exist for Comet. So just a heads up on stuff on Kickstarter, which could have been great, but has left me with a profound feeling of but emptiness and disappointment. Take place in a desert. Aren't deserts vast and all dull brown? So shouldn't it sort of reflect being <laughs> vast and all dark brown and dry? All dry. Well, it's not like the Nile was fertile or anything. Very briefly glanced at it, and it was just all beige. It was just just didn't seem. Yeah. Anyway. And so that's the news and why it doesn't matter. Now we're going to move on to our feature game. Walker, what's our feature game this week? Our feature game this week is Clans of Caledonia. So Clans of Caledonia was put out in 2017 by Juma El Juju at Karma Games. Juma El Juju previous design pedigree includes a one game called Green Deal that I have not played, and I don't know that anyone else has. Clans of Caledonia is a medium-weight Euro game with asymmetric powers, resource management and production, and building placement on a hex grid with the Vegas Whispers of Area Control. And other than that, has absolutely nothing in common with Terra Mystica whatsoever. Walker, why don't you, give us, why don't you give us an unhelpful, unhelpful summary of what one does in Clans of Caledonia? So in Clans, you're trying to find that crucial balance in, like, other engine builder games, like... When, how, how long you're going to build your engine and when you're going to start running your engine. You gotta make those shillings while ensuring you're getting the most out of all the bonuses, i.e. the neighbor bonuses, the round bonuses, the map bonuses, and your clan bonus. You gotta make sure you fulfill those orders. Not only does the player who complete the most orders get a bunch of points, but all those unique resources that are on those contracts all add up for a great source of points. So I'd like to start right away by pointing out something that I've mentioned in the past when talking about Clans of Caledonia. I think it's pretty classless that Terra Mystica is not credited anywhere in the rulebook. It is theoretically possible. 
the Juma al Judu never played Terra Mystica and miraculously spontaneously invented a game that is almost entirely identical to Terra Mystica in its fundamentals, but different in some of its other details and some of its added notions. I do not think that that is plausible or probable. And so I, I'm very firmly of the opinion now that rule books ought to have wherever possible designer's notes and failing that at a minimum, some sort of acknowledgement when you have been heavily inspired by a previous inspirational work. It doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't open you up to legal action. It is the mark of respect that I think you should do to a fellow creator. And the fact that it's not anywhere in the box of Clans of Caledonia, I think is unfortunate. It's true. It's because it, it, the, the look of it is much the same. You know, you you have this tableau in front of you where you're moving stuff off your tableau onto the board and it creates resources, you know what I mean? And there's very, uh, like sort of a race onto the board with, you know, the same sort of blocking mechanisms and, and that type of thing. And the end run bonuses are the same. Yeah. The one thing I was, I thought was a little bit boring was the fact that in Terra Mystica and Gaia project, uh, the, the whole board for each, each faction was, together right so they could even change up how the board was laid out and i thought i thought you know they could have done uh, although it would have made it that much more like the game i just thought that it would make the clans that much different if they just sort of switched up how the boards you know were different because when you really look at the boards they're just a placeholder for stuff except for you know the far right side where the workers are where it increases your income the rest is is literally just a placeholder for your pieces because nothing changes. Well, here's the thing. This You're right that this is one of the key differences between Clans of Caledonia and Terra Mystica, but this is actually one of the ways in which I prefer Clans of Caledonia because the powers, the asymmetric powers that you start with, don't give you new rules subsystems. They don't fundamentally change the nature of your economy. It's like, oh, you, you don't build buildings like that. You build this other building, and when you build this building, it opens up this new mechanism that other races don't do. And oh, by the way, you have twice as many power tokens as the other races do. Like, all that is fine. I'm not saying it's a serious problem. But I appreciate that in Clans of Caledonia, it's much cleaner. It's kind of like the approach that Marco Polo takes. Everyone's playing the same game, but you have some weird twi twist on top of things, rather than an approach like Root, where everyone's playing a radically asymmetric game. I think it works in Root, because Root's fundamental mechanisms are not as heavy as those in Clans of Caledonia or Terra Mystica. And as a result, it's easier to get everyone on the same page, and it's easier not to get overwhelmed. Whereas in things like Terra Mystica or Gaia Project, I sometimes felt as though the power that I was given, number one, required a considerable amount of rules internalization up front, and number two, possibly as a consequence, kind of sort of railroaded me into playing a certain kind of way, which I found a little unsatisfying at times. Whereas in, in Clans of Caledonia, it's much, much cleaner. Well, now that you, you sort of said railroaded off the front or a heavy rules load off the front, I have this like near the end. But I really feel from, I think I've played this game more in the last two weeks than I did any other game we reviewed. I've played it at least probably about 15 times in the last two weeks. And I really feel to play competitively, I don't know if that's the right word or a word that I should be actually using when, when talking about board games, I think this game is way more front-loaded because you really need to see, because the board has all these different bonuses, the actual map itself has four different bonuses, you have to look at those and use those properly, you have to look ahead at every single round and see what the bonuses are going to be there, you have to you know, check your starting faction and what resources it's going to start with and sort of look down at all the contracts and see, you know, well, which ones can I fulfill quickly and get a bonus there. So I think without knowing all of that at the very start, just learning this game for the first time, I really feel as though Clans of Caledonia will put you further behind at the beginning of the game than Gaia Project would. <laughs> That's fair, but I think that's partially because of what I was talking about. It's because the systems are cleaner. It's less about system mastery and more about those tactical and strategic trade-offs, about managing your costs and exerting those map bonuses that are available to everybody. For example, just to, just to continue on this general theme about the ways in which structurally they're different, and I think that Clans of Caledonia is cleaner. Clans of Caledonia effectively, in terms of the overwhelming majority of your transactions, has a single currency, money. 
That's how you're going to be building buildings. That's how you're going to be buying other goods. And the other goods you mostly have, so you either make more money at the back end or to fulfill the contracts. So the goods don't have any inherent difference in and of themselves. Whether it's it's milk or cheese, you know, broadly speaking, it's just one more cog to put into the system. Rather than Terra Mystica or Gaia Project that have all these different, independent, mutually unintelligible currencies. Some of them you need to build these buildings. Some of them you need to build these other buildings. Some of them you need to build these other, these other things. So Clans of Caledonia, I completely agree with you, is daunting from a strategic and tactical perspective. And I have no doubt that somebody who's played more often or who's internalized these trade-offs better will completely grind your face into the dirt. But when playing Terra Mystica or Gaia Project, I feel more like I'm struggling with the system itself and the overall economy rather than manipulating the economy, if you understand my distinction. I do, but I don't I don't agree with it. I Like in Clans of Caledonia, there are 11 resources that you have. Seven that you're actually working with, like with the tobacco and the sugar cane and the cotton, you don't really spend those except for the end of the game where you spend them for victory points. But during the game, there's there's seven, you know, all seven resources, where in, in Gaia Project, there's really only three. You know, you have your ore, your knowledge, and your coins, and that's all you have to worry about. Well, you're forgetting power, for one thing. You're forgetting other races that have their own special uh, currencies. You're also forgetting shovels, which are sometimes a currency. You're also forgetting the fact that these, as I say, these 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 currencies are not mutually exchangeable. You're exaggerating the differences. You're right that in terms of sheer quantity, there are more different things in Clans of Caledonia. But at the end of the day, it's all just about money. If milk is trading at 10 bucks and whiskey is trading at 6 well, I mean, it's not that milk and whiskey are fundamentally different. It's just that the market forces that have brought you here are plugged in differently. And all buildings are built the exact same way. Pay money, put out the building. You cannot say the same in Terra Mystica and Gaia Project. Agreed. Some things I do like in Gaia Project, we were talking about this neighboring bonus. And it's sort of, a, it, it's sort of like not forces that player interaction, but encourages it, right? In Gaia Project, you have this interesting power system. And I agree that it's it's convoluted and 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 over overly complicated but i think it's very interesting because in clans caledonia it's very specific you know you build next to whiskey you get you know discount on whiskey you know you build next to that but it's very situational and sometimes you don't need it at all or sometimes it just doesn't work out where in gaia project that sort of knowledge circle it's sort of like a it could be a whole strategy where you're like cycling it over and over again and using it to get things that are usually harder to get to i agree with you entirely but that is i think the only area in which the player interaction in terra mystica is better than the player interaction in clans of caledonia or more substantial because in clans of caledonia you care about the market you care about the pricing of the market if people are buying a lot of a resource, it's going to be very, very expensive. And so you're incentivized to get into that resource so you can sell it at a very, very high profit or vice versa. And you're competing with each other for contracts, both to get the contracts and then to satisfy contracts that give you the more valuable payoff at the end of the game. It's effectively kind of sort of almost a stock mechanism. If people have made more cotton than they've made tobacco, which, as you correctly point out, are theoretically separate resources, but really they're just points at the end of the game. So you don't spend them. You just gather them by, by completing contracts. The less produced commodity is worth far, far more. And so if nobody's produced any tobacco, you can look at that tobacco contract and say, ha ha, this is going to be worth a lot more at the end of the game. Now, in terms of player interaction for a medium weight economic euro, this is not what you would call excellent. Like there are no direct auctions. There's no uh, direct competition in terms of, of the market forces in the way you might find in something like Navigador or a whole lot of other auction-based economic euros. But I, I do find it a little bit more substantial than the player interaction in Terra Mystica and Gaia Project because, as you say, and this is also part and parcel of how complicated each person's faction is, it's it's pretty head down at the end of the day, as you would say. I have it down here as one of the really interesting parts of this game is those end game resources and the fact that you know, you, everyone's building them up and depending on what the final outcome at the end of the game, you add them all up and whatever is scarcest is going to be worth more points. I really thought that was a very interesting part of the game. And uh, another benefit of the contracts is it gives you some signposting. I love Euro games where the, the systems may be a little bit daunting at first and Clans of Cal Caledonia is definitely a middleweight. It's not particularly daunting, but there's a fair amount to, to, to keep track of. And when you're presented with uh, a, an empty map of Scotland and a whole bunch of different buildings you can put out, 
someone can very much be at a loss about what to do at the start. But if you hand them a contract and say, well, the contract wants you to have cheese and cows. It's like, okay, well, let's go do that then. And so it's, it's great for beginners and it's also great for experienced players. The experienced players will be able to manipulate the market in a more robust way, but the beginners will have some signposting and a bit of a leg up, a little bit of direction at the start, which is always helpful. Yeah, I'm glad they didn't make the market all weird. It's just the standard, you know, if milk is eight, you can buy as much as you want as eight. And if you buy three, then after the purchase is done, you know, it gets more expensive. Or if you sell it, it goes down. They didn't overcomplicate it, which was really nice. Next thing I want to talk about, I'm going to just merge these two together. It's this, there's this, this settlement scoring thing at the end of the game and the, and how the map I feel is sort of built. Uh, you know, you could say this is a good thing or a bad thing. The map is sort of built to slow you down and restrict you where you can build. Like only workers can go in mountains and, and wood, woodsmen can go in woods. And it just seems, you know, we've talked about being handcuffed at the beginning, but maybe, you know, that's what, that's what it's for, but it just seems restrictive all the time. And that part I didn't, I didn't like so much. And the fact that it's just this weird competition to get this weird spacing of your guys so they create you know, these weird little pockets, right? So you can get the big 18 points at the end. Yeah, you're incentivized to expand in a strange and inefficient way, which I it wasn't really to my taste either. And it's one of those holdovers from Terra Mystica that I wish they'd, they'd gotten rid of. In Terra Mystica as well, your expansion is effectively very narrowly funneled because you like a certain terrain type. And other terrain types are just very expensive for you. And so you'd best build towards that. One thing I will say in favor of Clans of Caledonia's map, though, is that it is modular. And so it varies a tiny little bit every time. No, not in a super exciting way. It's like, oh, now the, the, the hex near the center of the map costs $5 to expand into rather than 2 But it's something, at least, in terms of giving the map a little bit of variety. Well, that, and I have, there's a whole bunch of variety, actually. I just have a thing here. You're going to get a different clan every time. There's round markers, like there are, in, like, sorry, round scoring advantages, like there are in all of these games. They're going to be different. There's nine of those, so they're going to be different every game. And the map bonuses, on the four corners, you can build out and use these four different things, and there's nine of those, and so they're going to be different every game. So it's a, it's very random every time, not like not a, like a different game experience every time. I really like how that's done. Right. Another thing that I like, just the physical production of the game, I liked how they decided to go for a sort of minimalist box size and production. It's not that they skimped out on any of the components. The components are perfectly nice, but they're no larger than they need to be. You have custom wooden tokens, but a very small number of them, and they're relatively small. Easy enough to manipulate and easy enough to see, but it all fits into a very, very small box. It was relatively economical, and in an age where, and this has been true for, for at least five years, where Euro games are getting bigger and more expensive, I really appreciate the fact that they put it, they put this medium weight game in a box that's vastly, vastly smaller and cheaper than other games from which it was directly inspired, Cough, Terra Mystica, Cough. Yeah, you can get the metal coins if you want to, and you can get the, the special sleeve or whatever, but the base game is this tiny, slim box packed with gameplay, and that's the way to go. Yeah, and it plays very much like Gaia Project or Terra Mystica, where some people are going to get an economy going a lot sooner, so... uh you go, you do turns back and forth. It's a very fast flowing game, much like the other ones. And then suddenly you're going to run out of resources. You're going to find the, you know, try to find the best way to eke out the most actions during your turn. And then eventually you're going to pass and they do it differently in each game. And I think in, in both games, it's done very well in clans of Caledonia. When you pass, if you're the first to pass, you get more money next turn and you get to go first in Gaia project. It's much the same thing. There's all these turn bonuses that you're going to get. So when you pass first, you're going to get first choice of those and you're going to get to go first as well. And I think both games work very well that way. I agree. Ultimately though, in terms of how I feel about Clans of Caledonia, because I had, I played it a number of times when I first got my copy. This was a couple of years ago. And then I started playing it again because you wanted to play it on Board Game Arena and we were going to review it. And so I, I played it a bunch since then. But I was reminded of why I stopped playing Terra Mystica, Clans of Caledonia, and to a certain extent Gaia Projects as well, because, because the system is cleaner. And because it's all about a single, it's mostly about a single currency, namely money, and it makes it easier to evaluate how much you can do over the course of a round rather than juggling different incommensurate resources. It, it kind of emphasized to me how unfulfilling I find all these games. You're playing this middleweight, not inconsiderable 
uh, amount of detail Euro game, and it all just feels like small ball to me. You're spending all this time, and effectively all you're doing is you're plopping out these buildings on a hex map. And you don't get the same sort of tense head-to-head player competition or trade-offs that I get in Euros that I vastly prefer. Like, for example, this is this is an arbitrary example. If you compare it to a game like Stevenson's Rocket, where you're also, you know, it's a Euro game with a hex map, but at the end of the day, it's all about these tense auction decisions you make in terms of directly competing with everybody else. And the market for the stocks of the available uh, railroads is always hotly contested and you care where everyone else is. When you compare games like Caledonia and Terra Mystica and like that, they're comparatively head down they're comparatively about getting more out of your nickel than compared to everybody else. So it's more just about straight efficiency. And that's fine. I'm not saying that it's unpleasant. But at the end of the day, I, I'm left feeling a little unfulfilled by games of this ilk. And I, I w- I'd rather, at the end of, say, 90 to 120 minutes, as you might get, especially with new players in, in games of this ilk, although Clans of Caledonia is a little bit faster than that, 75, if, if, if everyone's hitting the ground running, I often feel like I just want to have done slightly more than, oh, well, I put out a couple cows and I made some money. Yeah, I agree. I felt as though in Clans Caledonia, it's very much heads down. Like we, I'd played a game with a friend and we invited a rando, which, you know, had, you know, 800 ELO or something ridiculous. And we tripled (laughs) our score, but we were talking about it afterwards and it really didn't matter because in much, almost every game of Clans Caledonia, you're not really blocked by other people. There's, it's very easy to manipulate around the map and get where you need to go. Unlike Gaia Project, where there are key planets that you usually are, are racing for to try to get and block people off. And I think the interaction in Gaia Project is much better than it is in Clans of Caledonia. Yeah. I don't know about that, but I, I do agree with you that at the end of the day, in terms of Clans of Caledonia, the expert is grabbing up all the cheap real estate, and you don't feel blocked. It just so happens that as you expand, it's much more expensive and inefficient compared to what the expert's doing. So uh, you're right that that gives you a, a sort of a sense of, of, of a release valve, and it's less frustrating, but at the end of the day, it kind of blunts some of the, the competition as well. I, I will return to my previous point, though. I do prefer that at the end of the day, it's all about calculating how much money you have to put out your buildings rather than juggling different different sub systems and different different currencies in many ways because it's cleaner i think that clans of caledonia is both my favorite version of the system and also highlights the shortcomings of the system it lays bare uh i think sort of the, the horizon to which i can fully appreciate it and so ultimately for me to sum up and i'm going to be quoting the eminent and esteemed scholar michael walker esquire here this is a game that i would happily play if put in front of my face but i would never suggest it I don't regret my time with Clans of Caledonia. It, it's, it's a nice little system, and I do appreciate the changes that it does to previous systems before it, but I'm not going to suggest it. I did get rid of my copy. I'm not going to be getting a, a, another copy back. My sum up would just be, while I was playing Clans of Caledonia, I was just wishing I was playing Gaia Project instead. You know, that being said, it, you know, you can say it's much the same. You're putting out, you know, buildings and and taking buildings off and upgrading buildings, and, you know, it doesn't make much sense in either, but I think the just the universe scope, planet scope, it just sort of, you know, you can make the theme make more sense than, you know, just this localized Scottish hub. Walker, I can tell you that any game involving the production, consumption, or sale of alcohol is automatically awesome. This is what pop- popular culture tells me. Ah, touche. <laughs> Look, some people are like on the topic of the theme, though, because you're bringing it up just to just to close things off. Some people are really jazzed. Like, I know a lot of people that are super into being Scottish or super into Scotland and and Scottish clans in general. Like the overwhelming majority of boring white guys in Canada, I'm of Scottish extraction as well. I just don't care. I'd rather be a blob of tentacles myself. Fair enough. And on that note of personal disclosure, thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. <laughs> if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236, best guild ever. And you can find us on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we will get back to you if we can. Thanks again so very much for tuning in. We hope to see you again soon. Take care and stay safe. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. 
Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right. But remember, you are so very wrong.